Mr. Adman, you are the priest and poet of the commercial age. It's you that finds wares and sensate as ditch water and etherealize them into a success that shines like the cumulus clouds of sunset. It's you that transmute Pittsburgh steel into African bridges and teach the pinch-minded provincial to read and travel. But say, wait, brother, there's one gosh-awful great big butt, get me, a B-U-T, broad as a barn door. But your ads must be founded on the excellence of the goods. You can flash up a rust-eaten stove on a full-page set in 72-point gothic, but never make Doc Ultimate P. Consumer believe that the stove is honest, sure, heating his little old shack. Top of the column, next to reading matter, with peppy copy done by Henry James or John J. Shakespeare, Billy Sunday, never yet turned a pumpkin into gold nugget. Brer Adman, get hooked up with a by Jiminy firm that produces the honest goods, the good goods, before you attempt the snappy display. Hello, this is David. Hey, this is Nick. And this is Nathan, and welcome back to the Boss Podcast. Today we're talking about Sinclair Lewis's early business stories, Snappy Display, and The Way I See It. Um, these were stories that were written between 1915 and 1920, and kind of explored Sinclair Lewis's experience in business and advertising. Yeah, and the, the first story we read, Snappy Display, was written in 1917, and deals with the hucksterish ad man Lancelot Todd, who is, uh, over the course of the story, sort of slowly conned by a covert suffragette. I gotta say, this this was the first ever writing by Lewis that I've read, and for the most part, I, I enjoyed it up until the, the reveal of that con at the end of the story. Uh, like, I enjoyed the, the sort of snappy, witty language, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, the slang of the early 20th century, but it was an odd way to be introduced to him, I think, because I'm not sure how much it reflects his other writing. And I was going to ask you, Nick, having read a lot more of his stuff, was this a good introduction to his writing? Yeah, I think it's a reasonable introduction in terms of like a lot of that vernacular you mentioned. But in terms of, I would say, the quality and kind of the overall scope, these are sort of uh, very poppy stories. They were produced in, in entertainment magazines and uh, you, you very much get the feel that Sinclair Lewis was, was kind of getting paid for these. I mean, obviously, people were getting paid for their stories, but that he wrote he wrote them with that in mind. And so I think a lot of like the plot development and the quote unquote twist at the end, which is just as obvious as anything, uh, it, it's not exactly it's not exactly as refined. And in a weird way, I don't I don't think it was supposed to be that refined. But I think a lot of his writing style and the verbiage and some of the rhythms, especially in these little uh, snapshots from Lancelot Todd, uh, one of which that we read at the beginning of the episode. I think that's kind of the sweet spot, and those are some of the things that sort of carry carry into Sinclair Lewis's uh, major skill set in writing, which is sort of this satirical emulation of reality that's that's pretty close to what's really going on, but he just like turns it up a notch and just makes it that much more absurd. And in a lot of ways, it, it kind of just amplifies the reality that was there anyway. Do you... Okay. That, that was the sense that I got. Sorry, Nathan. I was please. just going to say that in reading Sinclair Lewis, these and also um, Babbitt, which we're concurrently reading, I, I'm i not sure where satire ends and reality begins. Because it's I, I just don't have a, a good frame of reference about what advertising language was actually like in the 20s and what how people were actually speaking in the 20s. So I'm not sure if he's sort of just observing these things and kind of putting them out there in the open and what we accept as normal 20s is actually the stylized 20s and this is the real 20s so you're saying that you can't tell if the language is sort of hyperbolic as well as the yeah. characters okay uh, yeah that was that was a question i had myself especially the the passages from lancelot todd's endless series of sort of self-help books I guess you call them. I'm not really sure what they are. In a way that mirrors his his advertising style, this sort of very flashy language, grammatically incorrect, but somehow catchy and snappy and people pay attention to it. Like that's his whole shtick, you know? Yeah, I think that's a chunk of what he was kind of lampooning to start is that, you know, much like kind of today's world, you have you have affluent areas in the country that are trying to figure out ways to sell things uh, sort of uh, lower on down. And, and this is like Sinclair Lewis kind of, I think, making fun of the way that 
you take people that are in like a wealthy New York ad agency and they're trying to identify uh, with their constituency and the people who are going to buy these products. And so that the way they, the way that they do it is that they, they try to emulate their speaking, but they, they put in, uh, the mistakes and the incorrect grammar and all of that to sort of colloquialize it in order to just make it more identifiable. And I think that's, I think that's actually pretty much a real thing in ads anyway. And so this is just like the 1920s version of that. Now, whether or not it's hyper stylized that who knows, um, but I think that's exactly kind of what was probably driving him uh, out of ad advertising to start because just that general being conflicted of, of what you're doing in the first place. In terms of plot, though, that I think that confuses things because if I remember correctly, Lancelot Todd started out as like a grocer in some small town, right? And he sort of graduated up into this. Am I, am I crazy in re remembering that? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Okay. So in a way, he's sort of he is the every man who sort of falls into this racket and is using the language that he came from. Right. And I, I think that, I think that a gives Lancelot Todd a, an ability to do that. It's kind of like his secret weapon amongst the people who, who had never had that exposure. But I think uh, Sinclair Lewis, who I don't know if this fits into like his Marxist phase or not, but he definitely spent a good chunk of time, uh, you know, into that ideology I think he also makes fun a little bit of, of the self-made man who sort of uses every single possible angle he can to sort of ladder climb and, and identify with new groups of socialites and sort of pocket as much money he has at the expense of his coworkers. And so I think there's a, a layer of that going on in here too. I, th I think that was one of the, the parts of the story that I liked was seeing him in relation to his, his sort of uh, right-hand secretary, Benny Simpson. Throughout the story, it's, it's sort of told from that perspective of Lancelot Todd. So you're kind of looking at the world through him and looking down on his his page or whatever this guy is, Benny Simpson, who turns out to be the, the more heroic and gentleman. Right. And that, that kind of brings up the, the actual plot of it, which which I found to be smart in terms of Sinclair Lewis, who's, who's sort of writing this story that's meant to be mass entertainment and he's he's populating it with these kind of like easy conservative morals which is you know lampooning the guy that is dishonest and who's trying to take everything he can and you know trying to to get with the core idea of you know hard work is is good and you don't necessarily have to be a ladder climber in order to be successful but then he weaves in uh the fact that this is essentially uh in the time of women's suffrage so this is right before it was fully ratified at the national level. Uh, so he's he's building this story around Lancelot Todd getting basically a, a long con handed to him uh, for his disrespect for women. And I like that Sinclair Lewis is using a popular uh, means to sort of further that message. And that's something I found in a lot of Sinclair Lewis's other books is that written in this time period, he's actually, he's actually very progressive in a lot of ways and finds ways to uh, just communicate that to the public who are, uh, you know, just reading this book and, and story in real time. Do you think that the the public would have seen Lancelot Todd as the natural hero until the end? And so what Sinclair Lewis is saying, like, no, you know, this, the, the climber, the striver is not the hero. It's the person who clocks in and clocks out every day and is working towards some higher moral ideal. I think by making him the protagonist and sort of peppering the story with his own little uh, nuggets of wisdom. I, I think there, there's probably a certain number of people that would read that and at least, if not agree with what he's doing, at least side with him and empathize with him as the protagonist of the story. And, and maybe even also side with him as a boss and someone who's trying to, to sort of continue to pull himself i mean he's already pulled himself up you know by the bootstrap so to speak but it continue to sort of climb the social ladder of of achievement yeah he's kind of like a tony robbins character i mean if you if you think about the age of of the like the men's clubs and the chautauquas and like how do we how do we inform ourselves and and pursue this knowledge that he's sort of the self-help motivational speaker which i'm sure uh, a lot of us probably just think is total garbage and cringe every time you hear somebody like that. But then there's also people that identify with it. 
So I think there's, there's definitely a transitional point in this story where in the beginning, I think he's at least pretty obvious as annoying, but you don't really start to see some of his uh, poor behaviors and, and dishonesty until kind of like the latter two thirds or second half of the story. Yeah. I, I, and I think what, what throws it off as well is that opening passage that you read actually comes from him. And it almost, to me, when I first read it, I thought Lancelot Todd was sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like sending up the ad man and, and almost making fun of him in a way that he actually doesn't in, in the rest of the story. Does that make sense? Like I, I know Lewis is doing it through him in that section, but it, but it feels as if the whole thing is is overly sarcastic. You mean kind of like a positive roast of him? I, yeah, I guess a positive roast would, works. <laughs> um, but it, it does. It feels like it, it's poking fun at the ad man in a way that's overly praised. But an, but the joke hits later because you realize he's. He actually believes this stuff. But Lancelot Todd's whole character is that there's a good way to do advertising, right? That you have to start with... You can't do dishonest advertising. That's kind of his shtick. And and I think maybe because it's revealed that he's uh, two-faced in everything that he's saying, that Sinclair Lewis is kind of saying the whole medium of marketing and advertising is naturally two-faced because... You're always selling something. So if you say, you know, always be honest, you're not actually moralizing. You're just selling the idea of always be honest and what that can do for you or your service. Right. But it also kind of ends with a very positive, you know, the the con uh, conclusion is that they're going to start their own ad agency and and make it be very honest <laughs> yeah. and very positive. And it's kind of I'm, I'm doing an arm motion right now that I associate with the 1920s. Uh, it's not going to come through <laughs> on a podcast, but I think, I think yeah. For Lancelot Todd, he, obviously uh, his two facedness. They're 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 just uh, you know using him as the amplified example of kind of the corruption and and the hypocrisy and in, in ad stuff. But I think these stories have a much more positive underlying message than pretty much all of Sinclair Lewis's later stuff, which can be really bitter and really. Uh, just like a sledgehammer of satire where he just re- just repeatedly drives home points and, and criticisms. And I think these sort of walk that line where maybe he's not disillusioned entirely yet, or maybe he's just fighting, you know, through his teeth to make sure that these, that the destination for these uh, stories, the publications that are for the general public, uh, that, that they still accept them because, you know, all writers have, have their own bills to pay. And so I, I think there's kind of a, a tension there that uh, that comes out in this, where like the pop culture appeal versus uh, Sinclair Lewis slipping in some of these uh, observations. And I think also on top of that, the alcoholism hasn't soured him completely, so to speak. Yeah, exactly, he hasn't pickled his insides. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, to kind of hop into the second story, so way I see it, uh, kind of follows along a, a similar white collar path. But for this, it's, it's narrative, uh, point of view conversations from different characters. And, uh, I'm going to steal one of David's quotes from before, but it's basically kind of like a really bad, uh, complaining conversation in an airport bar where somebody just really hates their boss and they, they run through every single line of, of these terrible things that they did it and how they were always right and that the boss was always wrong. And then Sinclair Lewis then proceeds to the next section where it's from the boss's point of view and you get the other side. And to me, it was really reminiscent of kind of modern, uh, call it reality themed sitcoms that we have. So the office is a big one or parks and rec. And, uh, I think it's a very identifiable thing that has a message that, you know, Hey, we all have our different opinions. And at the end of the story, they, they kind of come together and they become the best of friends. And it's sort of approaching just like this white collar. This is the scenario we live in. There's this tension. And I think in the year 1920, when it was written, uh, you know, you just hadn't seen it that much because white collar work was really kind of new. <laughs> that they just ruin everything by just that, that was no. that was great. I think you said everything that needed. That was to be great. Said. I just yeah, I was like, <laughs> I don't, 
know what to add to that. Yeah. Besides, yeah, but it wasn't that good. <laughs> I, I worry about this sometimes. You're like, fucking Nick, shut up. Uh... <laughs> well, you you you, re- you capture it well, <laughs> and and I think because it there's not a whole lot there beyond what you just captured. It's hard for us to to sort of to go through any nuance to it because it it does feel. I I guess the style is a little interesting. Nathan, you liked it more than I did. I felt it to be a little gimmicky, personally, and by the end, I just felt. Not that the ending was happy, but that it was a sort of continued rib at these characters' disillusion of what goes on in their everyday life, whether or not they're lying to themselves. They clearly are lying to each other and keep that up, because you see both of their sides of the story, and then when they meet at the end and they remember what happened, they make up a new third version of something. That it was the other the other boss that actually set this whole thing in motion, you know? I don't know, I, I I do think that's interesting. I mean, what we understand to be... And I, I don't think that it's necessarily that interestingly executed. But in the abstract, the sense that what we accept as truth is mostly our perspective. And we don't necessarily even remember what we thought was true. We're, we're constantly rewriting that. I was I was surprised that when I was reading it that I had a reaction that I think a lot of people in the 20s when they were reading it had, which was I found myself with the realization that these types of conversations are what I have with my own coworkers, you know, just the level of inter-office gossip and, and always just remembering to ram home the idea that you're not the only person, that there's other people with other views. Sometimes you can just get so caught up. And again, kind of going back to like Sinclair Lewis doing this this new topic, this white collar work, I think that's kind of a cool thing that a hundred years later, it still holds up in that manner. Now, I know Nathan, you were saying that you, you found some particularly uh, awesome stuff just in how much Sinclair Lewis knew about like fonts and whatnot. Yeah, I guess uh, one of the things that I did enjoy about this was uh, his specificity in terms of what it was like to write copy Um mentioning Caslon open face, which was like a brand new font and probably pretty trendy at the time or it's 72 point Gothic. Um, I just, I kind of got a kick out of that and seeing that, you know, and, and for that matter in this story, like everybody's confessing to who is basically their graphic designer, their, their sign maker. Um, and I can definitely relate to that being like a contractor who comes in, people will tell you stuff that you're like, Whoa, <laughs> <laughs> uh, cause that, you know, they know you don't know anybody else. So, yeah, you're you're like the confessional sink for them. Yes, yeah, so I guess we've kind of maybe not been overly positive about these stories, but you know, if we read them through the light of which they were produced as as maybe kind of the relics that they are, you know, does that that change your guys' viewpoint? Um, it's interesting to think of these in the medium that they were published, you know, imagining picking up an old Saturday evening post with a Norman Rockwell painting on the front and just kind of discovering how people were passing the times, what they were laughing at, um, and not reading it necessarily for its literary value, but as, you know, entertaining fluff, maybe it gives it, helps, helps give it a little bit more context. Yeah. I, I think as time capsules, they're, they're interesting to read. Mostly for me, it's, it's the jargon, the slang, the way that they talk to each other. I don't know how accurate he is at dialogue, but it feels accurate. You know, looking back, like I, I can imagine people sitting here and having conversations like these. Um, and, and so for that, in that way, it's interesting to read. But as as stories that linger in my mind, they don't. Like I can't imagine I will remember much of these a month from now. Yeah, and I, I kind of got the vibe of a book that we had read pretty early on in, in the Boss Book Club, which was uh, Maltese Falcon by DeShiel Hammett, and sort of that early 20th century hard-boiled you know, detective fiction. And the vernacular isn't identical, but just kind of that, that snappiness and uh, how crisp it is and how, I keep coming back to the word poppy, but it, it feels like that. Now, of course, DeShiel Hammett did a lot better with 
with his plot developments and uh, kind of coining that whole genre. But uh, I, I think with that as the comparison, it definitely is this kind of cool time capsule. And uh, I'm kind of appreciative of being exposed to it, but I will probably also forget about it in a couple weeks. Yeah, it, it, it's it's interesting, but it's I think that's just the way it goes. And especially, you mentioned earlier, a lot of these stories were written in probably a short amount of time to be published as quickly as possible so that he could get paid and keep writing. Um, so I'm hoping, I know you two are more into Babbitt than I am. I, I've only just begun, but I'm hoping that that sort of, that, that feel of, of doing something just to finish it and get paid is not in that novel. <laughs> yeah. I will say that Babbitt is way more refined and to me, a, a sharper thing. So I'm pretty pumped to talk about it next time around. And, uh, but a lot of these same tricks are still in there, but I just think that Sinclair Lewis started to just become a grumpy disillusioned guy and just started throwing bombs by the time he started writing his main novels in the 20, in the twenties. And that's, that's what makes it exciting to me. It's funny. I mean, I, I read this as pretty grumpy and disillusioned also, but I, I kind of throw away the endings. Like the endings are editor's choices, I feel like. <laughs> it's like, all right, you got got to sum it up, got to wrap it up. And that's kind of like fitting yeah. with what people wanted at yeah, the time. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Because if you just read it until the last section on both of these, I think, it's a more interesting I don't know, portrait of the times. And the, the end was kind of like, well, you got to make it meet our contemporary ideals gotta make it a more a morality play but he, he he subverts those somewhat right so at the end you get the idea that at the end of um a snappy display you get the idea that the ad agency they're going to start will not become something morally ideal no matter how much they might feel it will at the time you know there, there's no sense of 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 I don't know what the word, um, or at least I didn't get the sense that that was a possibility by the end of the story. Oh, really? I didn't... Not a real one. I didn't get that nuance. I okay. I thought it was like, we'll just keep on trying to do it right. Not advertising oh, really? is bad, but next time we'll get it right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's That's a good point, though. Maybe he wrote it in such a cheeseball conclusion manner that... It's meant to show that it's never going to be right. Yeah, it felt like overly naive to the point where it didn't match with his other writings, you know, especially the second time I read through it. And then the ending of Way I See It as well doesn't feel like there's a certain sort of charm in these two people coming together, but you get no real sense that if they were to leave in part that the story they told about the night they met would match up at all, that they would just probably continue some whatever bizarre i guess facade that they've created about how they feel about each other or maybe they honestly didn't remember each other at all yeah that one i, I felt that the negativity actually bled through even more because at the end you just have these totally isolated uh, pretty sad bachelor sales professionals who really don't have anything going for them and the the best camaraderie they can find is is in themselves right yeah and, it's in a weird way, it's positive because they come together and, you know, blame the third boss as, as being the real problem. Uh, but it, it feels super hollow. And I think that's, that's another example of Sinclair Lewis just kind of walking that line of, man, I really got to get paid for this shit, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I don't really believe it either. So I think there's some nuggets in there, but on the whole, these are, these are definitely not as sharp and as calculating as, as his, uh, later novels to follow. So what, what, if anything, do these two stories do for us as we go into Babbitt? For, for both of you, since you're much further along, do they, do they do anything to prepare you for ideas, writing style, what? Yeah, I think it shows where the writing style started, and that's probably the main thing. As far as the mentality and stuff behind it, there's, there's flickers of it, but uh, I think a lot of it's just masked by the, the popular entertainment uh, medium that it was in. So it's kind of a good introduction, but at the same time, I, I just don't get the same vibe and the same disillusionment that I get uh, with the chunk of Babbitt that I've read so far. Okay. Yeah, I'd echo that. I mean, one of the things that carries over definitely is his mixing of 
colloquial, like uh, copywriting. Like there's a lot of kind of copywriting that people read from magazines or kind of taken directly out of that as the voice of the times, not just people, you know, his characters talking about it. So it's kind of jargon heavy. Yeah, very much so. But I, I, I guess copywriting in the role of advertising in people's lives is a prevalent in both. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I would. I want to ask what for for a listener. What's the relevance of these, or is there any relevance? Is there any reason to seek these out or uh, uh, read these? I mean, other than the sort of time capsule into the beginnings of white class or white collar work world, which you know, I, I know I've read things that take place during this time, but never in this particular setting of the workplace. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but outside of that, like, I, I don't, I don't feel there's any, at least in these two stories, any great literary merit or anything lasting in terms of how it affects the way you think or feel about the world necessarily, unless it's to remind you that even back then, as Nick said, being much more in the office place, that things kind of tend to stay the same. In that, in that, in that regard, yeah, I, I think they're basically just a viewpoint into the past. That if you think about a lot of early twentieth century fiction, you know, you think of your Hemingways and your F. Scott Fitzgerald and and guys that were kind of just expats writing in Paris and uh, sort of living a, a life that wasn't necessarily a connection into that of uh, the regular man. So I, I think that these stories offer a lot of that uh, that wasn't covered by a lot of the greats that we typically associate the early 20th century with. But at the same time, I think, I think we're finding that, like regular life, uh, life for regular people in the 1920s was maybe also kind of boring most of the time. And so if you have stories that are trying to make light of that and trying to identify through that channel then uh, ultimately they're also going to kind of fall by the wayside rather than the, the romanticized, literary, uh, you know, ego-driven uh, works that we, that we love from the early 20th century. So I think it's just a view into normalcy, and it is what it is, and it's kind of interesting, but it, it ultimately, you know, will be forgettable. So we give this the, the boss thumbs down. <laughs> uh, yeah. I... It's... <laughs> It would be a very... I, I wouldn't recommend anyone reading it unless they had the book in their hand and had, like, 10, 15 minutes to kill. Yeah, of, of like, the... I think I've read, read five Sinclair Lewis books. I would probably recommend this lower than some of the ones that I haven't read yet, just because I think those other books are probably better than this, too. <laughs> but if you're just really into understanding where, you know... Uh, things started in development, and a lot of that is what happens when you read the early short stories of authors anyway. You know, I, I think of, like, collections from other people where uh, I love their major works, and then you read their just-getting-started stories, and you're like, eh. So I, I think it, it just fits into that category. And, uh, you know, I'm appreciative of the things we've kind of talked about and, and that uh, viewpoint in the vernacular and how cheesy it is versus maybe how authentic it is and trying to figure that out. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not exactly something that I will probably ever recommend anyone. Sorry, Sinclair. I think that about wraps it up. Thanks for listening, everyone. Join us next time on the full-length episode where we go into the book that won Sinclair Lewis the Nobel Prize, Babbitt. Some would call it his masterwork. If you can't wait that long, there's three things you can do. Follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, or go to the website where you can see what's coming up next. And hey, listeners, we'd just like to announce the Boss Underground Press with its first release, a book called Power Volume, which was written by myself, Nick Scandy, illustrated by San Francisco artist Aaron Zonka, and comes with an official musical score by the band Minnie and the Bear. And I designed it. And Nathan designed it. Don't sell yourself short, Nathan. We're all artists. Thank you, Nick. So check it out on our website, booksofsomesubstance.com, and on 
Amazon, available on your local internet. favorite part um i just there was such an awkward pause and it just i lost it i lost it beep 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 beautiful